Medium access control for local AR networks. In the previous section, we've seen principles for how several senders can access a shared medium. They can use carrier sense to lower the probability of collisions, and they can use collision detection to lower the cost of a collision in time. First, let's look at the communication on a LAN. Local AR network in the smallest configuration are multiple nodes that share one common data link. The nodes are at different locations on the link and each node transmits frames on the link. So they share the link by synchronous time division multiplexing. The primary problem is to control the sending of the data to avoid the two or more nodes send at the same time. So we see for the carrier sense, it avoids some collisions, but it doesn't prevent all collisions. But here I will also present methods for medium access which prevent any collisions from occurring. The goal is a simple and cheap solution for networking a group of computers together using one shared link. The characteristics of local area network is that they cover a small area with a limited number of users, and all nodes can communicate directly over this one link that they share. It uses a shared medium and the transmission is broadcasting on that medium. The network elements are simple and it's simple to manage this uh, small network. The property of local air networks is that the propagation time is negligible compared to the frame transmission time, which means that regular stop and wait ARQ is an efficient error handling method. It also means that the carry sent works well. If a node transmits, all other nodes will soon hear about it. But there is one case when carry sense does not work very well, and it's referred to as hidden node problem, and it occurs in wireless networks. We have here a configuration of sender A and sender B sending to this receiving node in the middle. But nodes A and B cannot hear one another. This is because the radio medium has a high attenuation and the radio signal is propagating in all directions, not only in the direction of the receiver and sender B. Also we assume that the nodes have half duplex interfaces, which means that sender is in ascending mode and the receiver is in a listening mode. So here sender A communicates well with the receiver, but if sender B gets something to transmit, it will listen and it doesn't hear the signal from A. So it might start sending as well, and there will be a collision at the receiver. So carrier sense doesn't work well for hidden nodes. And as we said before, collision detection doesn't work on the wireless network because the transmitted signal is stronger than the received signal and it would require a full duplex radio interface of being able to send and listen at the same time. So the principle of medium access control for wireless network that has been developed is called carry sense multiple access with collision avoidance, CSMA-CA. It uses carrier sense and it has non-persistent transmissions. We said that packets or frames that arrive at the node when the medium is busy create a backlog. Nodes that are not backlogged can send after sensing the medium if idle for some time, while backlogged nodes have to transmit after sensing the medium idle for a minimum duration of listening plus some random waiting time. And this is the non-persistent uh, strategy to lower the collision probability. The carry sense multiple access with collision avoidance provides all nodes in the network with the same rate of transmission opportunities. So it's fair in sense of access to the medium. It uses a stop and wait ARQ, so there are acknowledgements confirming each successful transmission on the medium. And there is an optional use of control signals before transmission, as I will show. There are quote, request to send and clear to send, and they would avoid hidden terminal problem, because either a node would hear the request to send from, from a sender, or it would hear the clear to send from the receiving node. CSMACA uses different types of spaces that are defined in the protocol. The longest of interframe space is called Distributed Coordination Function IFS, and it's the minimum access delay that a frame would incur in before it can be sent on the medium. Distributed Coordination Function is the name given to the CSMA CA as it's been standardized for IEEE 802.11 wireless local area network. 
There's another interframe space called a short interframe space. It's used for immediate response actions, such as sending an acknowledgement after a correctly received frame or sending a clear to send after a correctly received request to send that can be accepted by the receiver. There exist other interframe spaces, but these are the only two types that I will cover in this module. So let's look at this distributed coordination function, which is an instance of the CSMACA. I have three time axes, this time drawn horizontally, a sender, a receiver, and one time axis, which signifies some other node in the same network. So the sender is not backlogged, meaning that it does not have a queue of waiting frames. So it receives a frame, and then it senses the medium. It must sense it for a full D diffs. If the medium is idle for that period, it can then send a frame, as I've shown here. The receiver listens to the medium and receives the data. It checks the frame, and then after a short interframe space, it will send an acknowledgement. During some time of this frame transmission, the other node will have a packet ready to send. So it will sense the medium and see that it's busy, and therefore it's backlogged. When it's backlogged, it selects a random time. So here we say that the random value that was selected was 3. So after the other node hears the end of the acknowledgement, it will listen to the medium for a distributed interframe space because it's the minimum time that any node has to listen to the medium before it can start transmitting. But the other node has been backlogged and it has selected a random waiting time of three slots. So it has to wait for these three slots before it can send the data. This period that follows the diffs is called a contention period. And you see here that the total waiting time that this node had to access the medium is first the end of the previous transmission, a diffs, plus the random select number of first slots that it had to wait before it could send a frame. So let me summarize again the, all the details in this protocol. So non-backlog nodes have to wait for a diffs before sending, and the medium has to be idle for the entire duration of the diffs. The receiver acknowledges after waiting for a short interframe space. This time is much shorter than diffs. In um, the standard 802.11b, a SIFS was 10 milliseconds and a diffs was 50 milliseconds. The use of different interframe spaces gives priority. If a node would start listening when the frame has been received and before the receiver sends acknowledgement, it would have to listen for a diffs which is longer than SIFS and therefore the acknowledgement be sent before the other node could send its frame. So therefore acknowledgements will always have precedence or priority over new frames that could be sent on the medium. The SIFS cannot be zero because it has to allow both the sender and the receiver to switch transmission mode. The sender have to switch over to receiving mode listening for the acknowledgement, and the receiver has in the SIFS to first to verify the frame, generate the acknowledgement, and switch from receiving mode to transmission mode to send the acknowledgement. And as I illustrated in the previous slide, the backlog node will have to wait a full diffs, and then it has to wait the number of slots that it randomly draw when it was backlogged. And the procedure is such that each slot that it's counting down had to be idle. If a slot is not idle, then the counting is interrupted and the node waits for the medium to be idle again and then uh, enters where it left off. So if it would have here listened for the first slot and that would be idle, but the second slot would not be idle, then when it comes back to listen to the medium, it would wait the diffs and then it would have two slots remaining to count down before it could send the frame. And this is illustrated in this diagram here. So we said black backlog nodes wait for sending. They select a random waiting time. Then the sensor carrier, first always for a, a diffs. And then it starts to enter into the congestion period. If it's busy for a slot, then it continues to sense the carrier. If the slot is not busy, then it decrements T. And once T gets down to zero, then the frame can be sent. The congestion window default is 32 slots, and if there is a collision occurring, then the collision window is doubled, and this goes on for five different collisions after one another. 
and I said the, the timer is only decremented when the medium is idle, one slot at a time. This procedure reduces the probability of collisions. If two or more nodes generate the same timer value, then they will collide. But in the default window size, that's one chance out of 32 that two nodes would end up in the same slot. As I illustrated, if there are hidden nodes, the carrier sense will not work, and therefore there will be a collision, simply because the medium will not be sensed idle during the distributed interframe space, and a node would start to transmit even though there is an ongoing transmission on the medium. So the standard has developed a mode which handles hidden nodes. It's called request to send, clear to send, or RTS, CTS for short. So the sender here starts as in the previous case, but instead after it diffs, it doesn't send a frame, it sends a request to send. So this is a request to the receiver that this sender has a frame that they would like to transmit. After short interframe space, the receiver, if it's ready to receive the frame, will send a clear to send. And then from there on, it proceeds with a short interframe space, the frame, a short interframe space, and acknowledgement of the frame. All the other nodes on the network, if they're close to the sender, they will hear the request to send, and all will hear the clear to send. These two messages, the RTS and the CTS, contain a duration field that indicates the time that the medium is reserved for the transfer. This duration is the estimate of the duration for the frame, because frames are variable length. They are, have a maximum length, but they could be much shorter. So therefore, this duration field indicates for how long the sender would like to use the channel. All other nodes hear either the RTS or the CTS, and they take this value, and then they update something called a network allocation vector, which is a way for them to keep track of the reservation. During this period, they know that the channel is not available to them and they can go to sleep, for instance, to save on the energy from the battery, if they are mobile nodes. When this network allocation vector value expires, then this other node here can enter the channel in the same procedure as before. It will sense the channel, would have a contention window and send the data. It, of course, the other node could also use an RTS and CTS. The RTS and CTS, as said, works well for hidden terminals. The side effect is that the negotiation, first of RTS cleared with CTS before sending a frame, can be a high overhead if there's a very short frame to be sent. So the time to send a frame could be dominated by the time to negotiate the access to the medium. So in summary, IEEE 802.11, the wireless local area network, uses carry sense multiple access with collision avoidance. It relies on link layer acknowledgement and implements a stop and wait ARQ. It uses random backoff timers for backlogged nodes that come down only when the medium is idle. And it provides a means of using request to send, clear to send, which also resolves the hidden node problem. So if you now summarize the various random medium access methods that I've shown, we see that the original ALOA protocol is only of historic interest. It's a nice way to see how you go from a stop and wait ARQ with only one sender to a stop and wait ARQ if you have multiple senders. The carry sense should always be used to avoid obvious collision situation. Since Nodes get synchronized with respect to the acknowledgement, a non-persistent strategy for backlog nodes should be used. Collision detection reduces the cost of collisions. The collision cost can be so low that we can allow a persistent strategy to access the channel for backlog nodes. But the collision detection doesn't work well for wireless communication and would require a full duplex transceiver. CSMA CD is not used any longer for wired local area networks. They use instead point-to-point -point links to a hub and there are no collisions in such a network. As I said in the beginning, there are also ways of negotiating access to the medium which does not have any collisions whatsoever. Token passing is an illustrative method for controlling access and avoiding collisions. The token is a control frame 
so it has the frame header and the frame trailer but there is only control information and no useful data carried by the token. The token gives the right to a station to send one frame. So if A has the token, it can send one frame to any of the other nodes on the ring. Since there is a ring, the frame will reach all the other nodes. Once A is ready with the transmission and has received an acknowledgement from the receiving node, it will pass on the token to B. If B doesn't have anything to send, it will send the token to C. If C has a frame to send, C will send the frame, wait for acknowledgement and then pass the token on to D. And D can then send a frame, pass the token to A, and so the token circulates among the node, giving them the same opportunity to send frames on the link. This was implemented and standardized in a local air network called a token ring. Polling is another method of negotiating access to a shared medium. There, it means that there is a central node which polls the other nodes to ask if they have anything that they would like to send. In a wireless local air networks of IEEE 802.11 standard, there is a function defined for polling called point coordination function. And it's the access point, the central node in the network, which regulates this polling. It sends beacon frames, so uh, control frames at regular intervals, usually at 100, every 100 milliseconds. Between these beacon frames, so in the interval of 100 milliseconds, it defines two periods. The first is contention free, so it's free of collisions and based on polling. So it's an access point that's a coordinator and it sends polling frames to each node and such a frame grants each node the right to send one frame. Once it has polled all the nodes, then it can switch and have the remainder of the time allocated on a random access basis by using the distributed coordination function. So this polling mode could provide bitrate guarantees to nodes because you could poll nodes that have a lot of data to send more often than other nodes that have little data to send. The mode has been implemented by very few manufacturers, if any. And then I want to mention something called channelization. It means that the medium is divided into channels and each sending node is allocated its own channel and therefore there is no contention for each individual channel. We can do that in frequency or in wavelength. The frequency division multiple access is what we recognize from broadcast radio and television where each station has its own channel, a frequency band where it has the reserved right to send its signal. In optical networks we talk about wave division multiple access where each sender gets its own wavelength channel they can send. So we use different colors of the light and allocate a color to each sender. We can modulate the whole bandwidth of the channel and get a capacity out of it. And then we can divide the bit rate into slots of a certain bit length that we allocate to the different senders. So we need a framing structure which starts to number frames from one up to a maximum. So say we have 100 slots in a frame. Then we can say that the first node gets slot one in every such frame. So once every 100 slots, it will have its own slot occurring and it can send data in that slot. We could give it perhaps more than one slot. It could perhaps have the 10 first slots if it has a lot of data to send. But it has the reserved right to use the slots that it has been allocated. The negative side effect is that if it doesn't use the slots, those are wasted and not are, they're not available to any other sender which might have more data to send. Finally, there's a method called co-division multiple access where the entire bandwidth is one channel and data from all senders are transmitted at the same time. But each transmitter modulates its data by a certain pattern of symbols so that the receiver can tell the different senders apart and receive one of the senders and the other senders will just appear as noise to that transmission. So summary on multi-access links. Random access may lead to collisions. So we use carrier sense to reduce that probability. But we have to be aware that it doesn't work for hidden nodes. 
we can reduce the cost of collision by collision detection or by using the RTS CTS, which also works for hidden nodes. Because if a collision occurs on the medium, it's on the RTS and this is the shortest frame time and therefore we minimize the cost in time of a collision. The use of multi-access links is nowadays only for wireless communication. Wired networks use switches instead and there's no collision in, in such a network. The contention-free and the contention-based networks are in principle complementary to one another. Random access works well at the low load, but it's not stable when the load increases. And at high loads, the contention-free access remains stable at any load and allows the full capacity of the link to be utilized, minus some small overhead.